Try this together one more time. He is risen. He is risen indeed. All right, well, he certainly is, and that's why we're here today, and we are so excited to be here. Um, but, you know, proclaiming that boldly, proclaiming that loudly would have been such a... Uh, such an unexpected thing to do for the disciples because when Jesus was crucified and laid in the tomb and the stone was rolled in front when they went to their homes, they thought, they thought that was the end. They thought that was defeat. And you can just imagine what that must have been like. They had been the Savior, the expected Messiah, the one who was, who was proclaimed by the prophets, had come. He had done what Isaiah had said he would do. He had, he had healed the lame and walked, the blind saw. He was binding up the brokenhearted, and then he was gone. And they, they were looking for the expectation of a kingdom. And now their king had been laid in the ground. And you don't know what that time must have felt like, and how slowly it must have passed, and how confused Christ's followers must have been um, in the time that passed until the Sunday morning, when the women would go to the grave. And they were going to the grave... Um, just to have a chance to pay the final respects, to prepare the body as was often, as it was prepared in that time period. That's what they would do. They would prepare the body. They would put it with spices. He was given a basically a rich man's, he laid in a rich man's tomb. He was given a rich man's burial or a king's burial. Uh, and they wanted to give their final respects. And I, and I know that many of you, there's been times in your life when, when that's all you could do. There, there was really, there was nothing left to do except for say goodbye the only way that you could know how. And so these women, some of his closest followers, early in the morning, <clears throat> were going to anoint the body one last time. But everything changed. And we read that in, in, the, in the book of Matthew, in chapter 28, we read <clears> that now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. And the guards shook for fear of him and became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. For he is risen, as he said. Come, see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And indeed, he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they went out from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring the disciples' word. Let's go ahead and let's pray and let's just spend a little time considering what God's Word says. Lord, once again we say thank you and we pray that you would, you would meet with us this morning. We know that you are present in this place as you are present everywhere, but I pray that we would recognize it. And I pray that your Spirit would be moving in our hearts to show us the truth of you in ways that maybe we haven't anticipated or in manners that we should put into practice. But God, I pray that you be honored um, through us looking at your word and that you would change our hearts to more completely resemble yours. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, we see there, and very quickly, as the, after the Sabbath, it began to dawn, and the women, they went to the empty tomb, and as we just, just read from, from God's word, it says, the angel answered and said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. As he said, come, see the place where the Lord lay. And uh, it's, it's pretty amazing. Jesus was risen, the tomb was empty, and the angel told them to look and see. You know, we, we do that. We, we All around the world there are graves of famous men. You can go and see them. And, and monuments, and you can travel the world, and here lies this famous person. Recently, I was reading through through the newspaper how Richard III had been exhumed and he was being reburied in England. And lots of famous kings are buried in England because they had a lot of kings and lots of other places. 
You could go to Egypt and see monuments that were made to the dead, uh, these pyramids, which have since been looted and the bodies have been lost. But that's what they were. You could come and, and pay your respects or wonder of the people who went before. But Jesus' tomb was empty. There was no body. There was no person. They came to pay their respects, and the person they came to honor had already got up and gone. And what, what a glorious day, what a great confusion that must have just been going through their minds. And we see this. Uh, we'll come back to Mary Magdalene. Um, she was present. She saw the angel. But by the time she gets to the disciples, she's at least second-guessing everything she's just heard. Saying, we don't know who the body is. Um, and there's other ladies there too. And it says when they were talking their tale, it seemed like just fables, like they were just talking nonsense. Because you don't go to the tomb and expect the body to be missing. You definitely don't expect it to be alive. But Jesus was alive. And the angel said, come and see where the body lay. And um, this was a theme a lot throughout Jesus' ministry. And I want to look at this briefly this morning. And throughout his mission to save mankind as, as Christ, the perfect revelation of God Almighty for he himself was the eternal God made flesh. And he appeared in space and time to save us and to welcome us to himself. And time and time again when he appears, you hear those words, come and see. And then I hope you'll take the opportunity to just consider, to consider who he is, to take a hard look at it this morning and even, even as you go from this place, that Jesus Christ is who he claimed to be. That you too will take the time to come, to consider, and to look. But we see this uh, as, we, as we look up here. When Jesus first appeared to the shepherds. You remember this? Um, when he was born in Bethlehem. Not Jesus first appeared. The angels first appeared. Jesus appeared. He's born in Bethlehem. The angels had to tell somebody. Right? And they show, show up in, in the skies outside of Bethlehem to some shepherds watching their flocks. And we read in the Gospel of Luke. And it says, so it was when the angels had gone away from them into heaven that the shepherds said to one another, let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord made known to us. See, the angels came that night and they said, hey, by the way, the King of kings and Lord of lords, eternal God, and your salvation has just been born in Bethlehem. You might want to go take a look. <clears throat> and they were like, this is worth leaving our sheep for. They said, let's go see. A little bit later in the process, um, straight to Magi, wise men from the east show up and saying in Matthew 2 in chapter 2, verse 2 where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we have seen a star in the east and have come to worship him. They, God had broken the heavens and they had, they had recognized the signs they, they had deciphered from their own studies that there's a king being born and it, and it compelled them to journey miles and miles to come and to see and Jesus was an, a person was, of course, more than a man. Worthy of coming to see. Even when, uh, when Jesus began to minister up in the Galilee and calling people to himself to reveal who he was, that he was the promised Messiah, that he was the Savior of the world, uh, and people began to gather together. First John the Baptist had been commissioned by God to prepare the people. And so he's telling people, basically, the Messiah is coming. Get ready. Get your house in order. You want to be in a right state when he comes. And then Jesus comes and he introduces him. And some of the people who have been around John are now changing their focus and their interest to the expected one. Namely, John, the uh, brother of Christ. Not brother of Christ, I'm, I'm really messing this up. But John, the brother of Peter. And uh, they say to him, Rabbi, when they see Jesus, which is translated teacher, where are you staying? And Jesus, that is, he said to them, come and see they came and they saw where he was staying and remained with him that day. Now it was about the 10th hour. Pause there for a second. What I want us to understand that Jesus is inviting people. I am here. I invite you to know me. I invite you to have a relationship with me. Come and see. Well, one of the two who heard John speak followed him and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first found his own brother, Simon, and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Because at that time, once he had seen, 
Once he has seen Jesus, he wants to tell his brother, and he wants to bring him to come and to see. Uh, this, this goes on again. We, have, we see that the following day, Jesus wanted to go to Galilee, and he found Philip and said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, the city of Andrew, and Peter. So Philip has now seen Jesus, so what does he do? Philip found Nathanael and said to him, we have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Philip is excited. He said, we found the Messiah. What do you want to tell his friend? Well, let's read. Well, first Nathaniel. He's not real big on Nazareth. Um, he's not. We, we joke around out here. Some of you live out there. I'm sorry. We go like, it'd be kind of like if they came here to West Valley this morning. We found the Messiah. He's from Tooele. And you'd be like, can anything good come from Tooele? <laughs> we have some really good people from Tooele, by the way. Shout out Park. But that being said, Nathaniel said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? And Philip said, come and see. Come and see. See, we we're invited to see who Jesus is. Um, time and again. And, and that was his message over and over. Um, these people had met Jesus. They wanted to share them. Um, do you ever see how, some of you have children or been around children? Some of you have heard of children. Um, they, they, uh, man, when they, when they do something, they just want to share it. it. It's exciting. Daddy, come see what I made. You're like, sometimes you're like, what mess have you created? <laughs> uh, you just know that. But, but it, it could be in my house. It could be Matthew. It could be Garrett. They could have built this Lego creation. It could be a painting on the wall. Who knows? Um, but they want to show. Come and see what I've done. Which is entirely different, by the way, than when the sibling goes, come and see what their, Garrett has done. <laughs> Matthew says that's a whole different problem. But um, they want us to come and see. Because... And sometimes you may be in the middle of something. Why do you go? Is it because there's a Picasso or a Rembrandt? Is it because they've made some great masterpiece? Or is it you go because you love them? Well, this message today when Jesus says come and see, it is because of his love for us that he's inviting us to come and see. And all, all in the... Uh, in the crucifixion and the resurrection is a profound statement of how much God loves you. That, that Sunday morning uh, when they had gone up to the empty tomb and the, the women had come and seen and they looked inside and said, Jesus is missing. Like, like here today, they looked inside uh, the real tomb and saw the grave clothes were neatly folded. It wasn't like a uh, gra grave that has been trashed. It's like it said the grave clothes all just laying undisturbed. And now they're a little bit confused and they run back and we read in, in John chapter 20. I'm going to start in verse 20. But as they went, it says now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, they have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter therefore went out, and the other disciple, and they were going to the tomb, so they both ran together, and the other disciple outran Peter, and came to the tomb first. And he stooped down, and looking in, saw the linen cloths lying there, yet he did not go in. Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb, and saw the linen cloths lying there, and the handkerchief that had been around the head. His head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who came to the tomb first went in also, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not know the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went away again to their own homes. They had to go and see. They had to see for themselves. Who is, has Jesus really risen from the from the grave? Because if he is, that's worth considering. And if it's worth considering, it's worth knowing. And I'm going to run to see, could this be true? And they went. And they saw that the tomb was empty. And then we know, we're to go through all the res resurrection accounts, that, that Christ appears to Mary, 
who by this point is entirely confused and crying, saying, I don't know where his body is. And Jesus appears and says, Mary, here I am. And he appears a little bit later. He alive, resurrected, to some men walking on the road to Emmaus. That he is raised from the dead. And then he appears to the disciples. They're, they're in a locked room. They're sitting there. They're gathered together, trying to figure out where to go from here. And we read that they were there. They saw Jesus. They were able to touch the wounds in his hands and his feet and his side. This is really Jesus. He is really alive. He was really dead. He has conquered death. He has returned. But Thomas wasn't there. And then Thomas comes back. And in verse 24, still in, in that chapter of John, we read how Thomas, called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. So he said to them, Unless I see the hands, the prints of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days, his disciples were again inside. And Thomas was with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in their midst and said, Peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach your finger here. Look at my hands. And reach your hand here and put it in my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Uh, and really that, that speaks to us. Those of us in this room, we didn't have the privilege of seeing Christ risen and physically. That doesn't mean it's any less impact. But we do. Don't we wait for that day? Kind of like Thomas and eight days in between where we just long to see our Savior face to face. But I don't, I don't know where all of you are in your relationship with Jesus. We call it a relationship because human beings were created for a relationship with God. <coughs> to know Him. To enjoy His goodness. To live in peace and perfection. And yet we are separated from God by our own sinfulness. By our own rebellion. And that, that broke everything. Human relationships, our world, certainly our relationship with God left us guilty. But Jesus Christ came to pay the penalty, our penalty on the cross, and He defeated sin, and He defeated death. And because of that, anyone who puts their trust in Him can be restored to the relationship we were created for. They can be forgiven, be given the gift of hope, be given eternal life. And, and I hope that's something you know today. And that's why we rejoice. It's not just because we want to celebrate a famous figure on the biography channel. But it is because God Himself loved broken, sinful man enough to buy them back with His own blood. And then He rose victoriously that we might too share in His resurrection. Now, if, 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 you, don't, if you don't know Christ, or you're confused about that this morning, I just want to make sure that you know what it is. And we even have this little little booklet in your, in your bulletin you can take home, the Hope Caesar. But... What it is, is the way to have that peace with God, to have that relationship with God, is completely wrapped up in what Jesus did. There's nothing we can do to make it right on our own. Salvation isn't something we can earn, because it's our guilt that is in the way. But rather, if we are willing to admit our sins before our holy God and say, I have sinned against you, and place our trust fully in Christ, knowing that we can't do it, and He is holy, and on our own, we would deserve judgment. And, and not just a little judgment. And we don't just need a little help. Like we need a push start. We need the whole thing. But if we're willing to put our faith in what Jesus has done. And in Him alone, He will welcome those into relationship with Him. Because Jesus was the eternal God. Become flesh. He entered His creation, born as a baby. He lived a perfect life, an acceptable sacrifice. And He died in your place, in my place. Being God, being of infinite worth, His sacrifice was enough to atone for the sins of the entire world, for the sins of all who would believe, who 
be applied to them. And that, that is where salvation is found, in relationship with God. If, um, if you don't know God and that's the desire of your heart, you can pray to Him, you can pray out loud, you can pray silently. The words aren't important. It's not really the manner of the prayer, but it's the honest expression of your heart, and God knows our heart. And you can say, Jesus, I know I am separated from you by my sins. I believe you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from death. I know that you are God. And I accept you as my Lord and the King of my heart. Please accept me as your child. Well, here's the great news. The promise of, of Scripture is it for those who received Him, to them He gave the who believed in His name, He gave the right to become children of God. In, in John 5, verse 24, it says, Most assuredly, I say to you, He who hears My word and believes in Him who sent Me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Ephesians 1, 7 says, In Him we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. See, now there's no longer a fear in death. 1 Corinthians chapter 15 says, Just as Christ was risen, we too shall be raised. Just as He was given a perfected, glorified body, we too shall be free from this body of death and destruction and sin. And we can live with Him forever. We have a life of hope, a life of purpose, and we are welcomed to be a part of God's family. And then, by the way, if you pray that prayer, um, whether on your way out or you said, sorry, Pastor, I already did it, we would love to partner with you as a church to learn what it is to live as a child of God, to live with meaning, to live with hope and purpose, to show you how a child of God should live through the reading of His Word. Not that you earn it after the fact, um, but certainly there are ways we should act as members of God's family. Don't get confused. That's not how you become a part of God's family. But we would love to partner with you and hear what God's done in your life. But I also know that some of you this morning, maybe here this morning, maybe you got bribed. Maybe, maybe they had, I don't know, they had too much dirt on you and you just had to come out this morning. <laughs> and they said, uh, you know, so whether it's like, you come, you'll hear the pastor talk for a while, it'll seem way too long, I'll take you to IHOP or buy an Easter basket. I don't know. But if you, if you aren't sure about this, if you're a little bit like Thomas, um, you're not ready to accept Jesus, please know that He is worth considering. He proclaimed that He was God's Son. He is the means of salvation. His death, burial, and resurrection were the means for us being reconciled to God. He offers life and peace, peace with God, peace internally as well, offering forgiveness and purpose and hope. And if that's true, or even in your mind, possible, that's worth considering. And so we want to say to you, like the angel said, who is sitting outside the grave, come and see. Consider who Jesus is. He says those who truly seek Him will be found by Him. Don't just dismiss Him. Take the chance to really consider who He is. Certainly you're welcome here. We'd love to talk with you. If you want to go home and look in your Bible, if you want to read about the life of Christ, you can start in the Gospels if you don't know what those are. They're the books Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, any one of them. If you don't know what those are, they make it easy. They put a table of contents at the beginning of every Bible. But get to know who Jesus is. Don't just dismiss Him. Because we are convinced here at Sunrise, and I am convinced personally, that He is who we claim to be. The hope of the world. The only way that you and I can have peace with God and salvation. And He gives life everlasting. Well, there is one more thing that happens. Uh, quickly, if you notice, come and see becomes go and tell. If you are a believer in Christ, uh, we need to now pass on what we have received. This is glorious news. This is great news. This is, is joy and a promise. 
and we need to take what we've been given because it's not something that when we pass on we lose it's something as we pass on it grows and other people can have the same gift of life and hope that we have there's not a quota or a measurement or a last call for people coming into the, in the heaven the only reason people don't go to have a relationship with Christ is because they refuse to receive it and so we do need to proclaim that and in fact, that was what Jesus told us to do. As he, 40 days after his resurrection, as he stood on the Mount of Olives with his disciples. And what did he say? Go. Tell. That's essentially the Great Commission. He says to make disciples, but he says, take this good news to the ends of the earth. Go and tell. Just like Andrew, remember we read about Andrew briefly, I probably went really quickly. When he saw met Jesus, what did he do? He went and he found Peter. When Philip met Jesus, what did he do? He went and found his friend Nathaniel. He says, you gotta come check this guy out. The shepherds, well, we don't read this part, but it, when Jesus was born, when they saw the baby wrapped in the manger and they'd seen the angels, it said they went out telling anyone who would listen. People marveled. And even the angel of the tomb, which we already read um, in verse 7 and 8 of Matthew chapter 28, says, And go quickly, tell his disciples. It was a command, tell them that he is risen from the dead, and indeed he is going before you into Galilee. Therefore you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples' word. I know that most people in this room have a friend or a special person in your life that you have to share good news with. And I don't mean like sending out a tweet uh, to everyone who's following you or updating your Facebook status, but I mean that one person you have to tell. You either have to get on the phone and hear their voice or tell them face to face. Because you're like, I just have to share this with somebody. This is so exciting or maybe even so tragic depending on the news, but I have to share it. Well, this is the best news ever. Christ has been raised from the dead and His resurrection is hope for all mankind for any who would receive it. The news, it's not ours to be hoarded or kept secret. It's good news for all people, for any who would listen and believe. For any who would come and see that the Lord is, Lord is good. He died for our sins and the grave is empty. So come and see and then go and tell. Happy Resurrection Sunday. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your generosity, for your mercy, and for the sacrifices you made on our behalf. And once again, but thank you so much for being victorious and powerful, reigning and coming to you. Lord, we put our hope in you. And we thank you for the gift of salvation accomplished in your death, burial, and resurrection. And I pray if there's any here who do not know you, that you would impress your goodness and love on you and the truth of who you are. And for the rest of us, Lord, please give us the ability to proclaim boldly the message of salvation. Thank you. In Jesus' name.